In 1950, Laura Lee was 10 years old when she became the focus of a highly publicized custody trial. The legal battle, which took place at the peak of her fame, led to the end of her successful career. The trial ended with a judge ordering Laura Lee to leave Hollywood and return to a normal life. Retired from fame, at the age of 22, she ended up in federal prison. And then she disappeared. This is the story of Laura Lee Michelle. So, mic check situation, okay? Because I take your care out. How visible is it that I have just logged off my shit and have just changed into something that's not pajamas? Anyways, I have had a question I have been pondering on because this case takes place in the US. So, this is a question for everybody. People in the US and everybody else then across the world, especially people in the UK, because I think here, once you've lived here for quite a while, you kind of have different opinions. Okay, calm your tits. They do not come. So, this case doesn't have anything to do with gun violence whatsoever. But I don't know why this fool popped into my head, but I had only realized in 2020, right, during COVID time when anything popped up on the internet and you would click on anything that even made the news remotely. So it's only then that I realized you can go into Walmart in certain places in the US and just buy guns or like apply for, you know, the gun permit, not the gun permit, the gun ownership, and they would have ammo and stuff. And that like baffled me, that did something to my brain where it scarred me to this very day. So for Americans, I want to ask you like, do you see that the rest of the world finds that wild? Because what would be the equivalent here, right? Like going into your local ASDA and just purchasing a gun and getting then the ammo for that gun in there. And also, for the Americans, what I find wild is how come that then there are no more crimes committed then and there, as in, like, robberies, people going in, massacres, not encouraging it, okay? It's just... So I'm missing something. I must be missing something. If, like, the store you can go to already has the guns and has the ammo, and has the food and like clothes and like all of these things that you can steal and rob. How are more crimes not committed within them? Like, is it to do with security or am I missing out on something? Do they not sell ammo as well? You let me know. And for the UK, truly, what would be the equivalent? Like, what, going to your boss man? <laughs> to the off-license? That would be so creepy. That would be so creepy. Is the off-license like equivalent to 7-Eleven, just so the Americans now understand what the hell I'm on about? Like the person across the road where you can get stuff. It would be pricier than probably Walmart, but um, it's convenient. Convenience stores, my convenience stores. Do you feel like you're under interrogation? Because that was the point of that light that is miles away from me. Well, you let me know the answers to that question, or don't. Mike check over. Let's dive into the case that has nothing to do with gun violence. All right. It scars my brain. It scars my brain. It's wild to me that you can just go into a shop, like a grocery store, and you can exit with a gun. That is wild. America, what's happening? What's happening? Detective Unit, you know how I like to tell you how I got here, how I got to discover this story? Cool. The story here is short, all right? <laughs> There's not gonna be much to the intro, because this story is so freaking fascinating. I've been listening to all of the podcasts done on it. I've been diving into the LA Times article on it and just, like, looking for anything else that I could find. Newspapers.com. Newspapers.com have been working its magic. Gotta, gotta dig deep. Gotta find those articles from the time that were all written in the most misogynistic, most sexist tone ever. Cool, we'll come to that. Anyways, um, how I got here. So, among the um, book array, let's call it that, that I have read last year, out of which I would maybe point out to, like, one or two that I would, like, recommend, and all of them are true crime books. Actually, yeah, probably more, because all of them would be true crime books that I read for this channel. And you know exactly what they are, because I would have spoken about them. There's a whole playlist on them. Listen to me. I have read one that is definitely true crime, even though it's not considered that. And that's the one on Jeanette McCurdy. Well, Jeanette McCurdy wrote her own book. It's her autobiography. And it's called I'm Glad My Mom Died. So it's the last book that I have read prior to... What's the one that's behind me? The uh, Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. That kind of also inspired how I have written this script. Again, we'll come to that. Cool. I'm just leaving you the breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel. This is already the most chaotic intro. So, Jeanette McCurdy. I read a book. 
it's triggering on its own, but it's probably one of the best books that I have written in a long time that isn't about true crime, or rather it isn't about a gruesome case. The sense when you are reading this book is that it could have ended that way. Had the mom, again, not died because, spoiler alert, is in, it's in the title, right? Had the mom not passed away, I have a feeling that somebody would have snapped. Janelle or somebody else. And that was sort of like how I went into that book and how I left it. And then I wanted to look up, are there any cases that don't have that publicity that I can talk about and research? And just as I wrapped up the book, Todd Grande released the video on Laura Lee Michelle. And, you know, Todd Grande's video is like 15-20 minutes long. I was like, cool, that's my lunch break. I listened to it, I was like, okay, okay, convince me, you convinced me, Todd, you want your cactus in the background, you convinced me. And then I went into a deep dive, and that is truly how we are here. If you are completely baffled by that intro and are completely unfamiliar with Jeanette McCurdy's story, the story of Laura Lee is the one of alleged child abuse. So the trigger warning for this video, because we are going to be heavily discussing the topics, would be the child abuse on many levels, from monetary, so exploitation of children for their own gain, the family gain here, to physical, and also the privation of food, calculation of the food intake, making sure that the child is slim enough to be in the industry. So if this is not something that you want to listen to, just, I would say, exit this video now and go and find another one that isn't on this type of topic. Unlike with Jeanette McCurdy also, we don't have Laura Lee's version of events here. And that is something that I find also interesting, because I wondered so many times throughout this story what would her angle have been, because we can only speculate, but you kind of have to wonder, like, if she had the chance, had she been found, or had she been just in the position to write a book herself, how would that look like? What, what would she say in the interviews? How would she have seen her own childhood? Because looking at exploitation of children through any means today is just so triggering on so many levels, but so interesting. Because there are going to be so many kids from, like, YouTubers, family vloggers, that will write books one day. And genuinely, I believe that none of those books would reveal anything that you and me would find surprising, right? All of it would be triggering. And all of those kids, like Jeanette, would say, like, this was insane. Like, this is actually messed up. Like, how did I go through this? As there is not much changing, the story of this day takes place in 40s and 50s, because that's when we know most information about Laura Lee. And it's so comparable to Jeanette McCurdy's story. It's so comparable to the stories of so many, like, celebrities that you see online where the children were immediately pushed into the spotlight and didn't really have the autonomy, didn't really make their own decisions up until the age of about 18. And now when they have spoken about their parents or adoptive parents, anybody really who was their caretaker, they don't really have much things to say, much nice things to say, let's put it that way. Because, again, they had been exploited to some degree. So it's a grim story on that level, but I hope you stick around. So before talking about Laura Lee herself, I'm going to tell you where she was born. A bit about the place where she was born, because I think it's going to put you into perspective, and also because it has one liner that I have read that is truly the most epic one-liner description of a city that I have read in my life. So, the small town of Schulenburg is located west of Houston, in Texas, and it is a home to Schulenburg Historical Museum. This museum still, to this day, from what I have read, features an exhibition about the life and the career of Laura Lee. Schulenburg, once a railroad hub, is now referred to as a place that is halfway to everywhere and middle of nowhere. I wonder if anybody from Schulenburg is going to listen to this, and if so, do you feel that way? Because it truly sounds like, I don't know, a catchphrase for, like, Tinder, if we are realistic. You know when Glossy Girl we released um, the posters, like the promo posters, with the negative reviews? That was such a powerful move. You have posters and then, like, 
the negative reviews from parents, like the slander for parents, as their own promotional pictures. That is something that I would like to see cities do. You know, you're entering to the city and it's like schuler mood. Halfway to everywhere, middle of nowhere. You're like, yeah, we take it, we turn it around, we take the power in. It's like, yeah, cool. So Schulenburg, right? <laughs> Laura Lee would be born here on September the 13th, 1940. And she was born as Virginia Joy. She was born to Lena and Willie Walker Williford in LaGrange, Texas. The couple would have, according to some sources, five, according to the others, six children. So nobody really knows the count, which is disturbing in itself, but they would have five to six kids, apart from Laura Lee. Laura's dad, Willie, who was also known under the nickname Red, would work as a truck driver and he would deal with cotton on the side. However, he struggled with alcoholism, and the money in the family was really tight. Lena, the mom, would be described by people as a runner. If she got too comfortable, she would have to leave. And I find this very interesting. Like, pin this in the back of your head, because Laura will end up being truly her mother's daughter, on so many levels, allegedly, in my personal opinion. So, eventually, of course, this kind of unit, this marriage, will end up collapsing. And when Virginia Joy, whose name would be changed later, not really by her family, yet another interesting detail, was five years old, a cotton broker and his wife, named Otto and Lorraine, would adopt her. And this is when she would start going by Laura Lee. The short of it was that the two of them didn't have any children of their own, and at this point they were 57 and 56. So they were really old enough to be her grandparents, but they desperately wanted a child, and this is when they adopted her. Now, there are different stories about the circumstances surrounding Laura Lee's adoption. Some of them would say that Lena just left her family one last time, and this time she ran off with a Baptist minister. And then Red, who was by this point really broke and also struggled with alcoholism, just couldn't take care of them. And that this led to the adoption. The adoption was like super official, right? So that's one version of events, where the children's services are involved, it's all by the book, and they're placed with Otto and Lorraine. According to the foster mom, Lorraine, that we are going to be heavily talking about, who is definitely a character, well, the story of the adoption happened a bit differently. So, according to her, Laura Lee was just in this store, and Lorraine looked at her, immediately fell for her, and just kind of saw her circumstances, saw that she wasn't super well off, and thought, well, myself and Otto can offer this girl a better life. The siblings end up being separated here, and one of Laura's sisters, who was heavily involved in search for her, called Barbara, would end up being placed with Otto's brother and his wife. She would say that the circumstances of the household where she was placed were quite different to Laura's. That Otto's brother and his wife were quite strict compared to Lorraine and Otto, where they did let this girl do a lot of things that maybe girls of her age at the time wouldn't really be doing. And when she was about five years old, she was adopted out to a couple who lived nearby in another tiny town called Schulenburg. Most of the kids were sort of form farmed out in different ways. She and a younger sister were adopted out to a pair of brothers. And early on, she had this sparkly promise. She could say nursery rhymes. She could uh, repeat dialogue. She had a real presence. If you're wondering about my personal opinion, I think the version that is closest to the truth is something to do with Laura being discovered in some way. Whether it had happened in a store or whether it was official, I have a feeling Lorraine and Otto had set their eyes on this girl because they saw how expressive her face was. They saw that this girl can really bring something to them. And immediately, as they would adopt her, they would put those wheels in the motion. So it became apparent to them that the girl had some talent. So soon they started putting her in those little pageant shows around Texas. These pageant shows would add another layer of creepiness, because they would usually be attended by soon-to-be governors, by the dignitaries in the Texas area, and actual children would be performing for them. So impressed by Laura's talent, one of these dignitaries sends a telegram to Warner Bros. Studios. 
they state that they should really give Laura Lee a screen test. And if not, they would be missing out on like millions and millions of dollars worth of talent from Texas. Even at this point, while still in Texas, Lorraine would get Laura Lee into the working habit. It would be a constant practice of acting, nursery rhymes, delivery of different lines, make it shine, you know, like do it through the rhyme, make it sparkle, have your face being super expressive. And this is very much Jeanette McCurdy for me, where the mom, usually the mom figure, without any qualifications, let's be honest, without themselves being an actress, is guiding this child and making sure that they get into the working routine, while Laura Lee here is six years old. She's six years old, getting disciplined by the adults who want her to act, without her having the autonomy really to decide that on her own accord. In 1946, with Laura being six years old, they would move to Hollywood. And this is when the auditions start taking place, right? She goes to auditions, dance classes, getting agent, everything starts moving, and Laura Lee is constantly busy. She would appear in several movies. Some of the most famous ones would be Good Sam, where Laura Lee played alongside Gary Cooper, then Tokyo Joe with Humphrey Bogart, and she also played the younger version of Olivia de Havilland in The Snake Pit. Crispy crunchies again, hmm? You've been eating those for two weeks. Only 11 more packages and I get my Indian soup. Oh, and what does Lulu get? She gets the same in my Indian soup. And then you said you'd help me get a dog. And this is wild to me, but Laura Lee and Lorraine actually lived in the apartment that would later become home to Marilyn Monroe. So just like with Britney through her conservatorship days and really through like the Mickey Mouse era, Laura Lee was working harder than any of the adults. Lorraine would enroll her adoptive daughter into dance classes and also hire the drama coach that was called Ona Wargin to sort of help her get the roles that she wanted to get, or rather, that Lorraine wanted Laura to get. So, Laura ended up performing in TV and radio dramas, plays, and at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel in front of 500 studio execs, impressing those who were attending it with both her singing and her dancing abilities. And the thing is, she was a natural. Even if you look at the scenes that I could find online, like small excerpts from those movies, she had a really expressive face. And according to the journalist that ended up covering this story and exposing it to all of us, it was really hard not to smile looking at Laura Lee act. She played the young Jill in Mighty Joe Young. She was in The Snake Pit. She paid, played the younger version of Olivia de Havilland. That movie went on to um, earn a number of Oscar nominations. She was well on her way. In a, a very short period of time, about two years, by the time she was nine, she was well on her way. Even in these early days of her career, she was regarded as next Shirley Temple because of her talent when it comes to acting and also just because of her nature. Like, she was quite friendly and also, like, wasn't just a diva, you know, like some kids at that stage, between the ages of 6 and 10, you can really see their nature coming out. She was really nice to everybody. She was just getting one role after the next. So by 1950, Laura Lee was earning about $100 a day. In today's money, that would be around $1,150 a day. The last movie, however, that she was credited for was released in 1950. So what had happened to Laura Lee from that point on? On the morning of January the 12th, 1950, her acting coach, Ona Wargin, the one that Lorraine had hired to coach her towards getting better roles, arrives at their apartment. And she arrives there to take Laura Lee for a modeling interview. Instead of them leaving that apartment and going for that modeling interview, Lorraine actually 
takes a detour and she takes Laura Lee to a police station. Now here, what she tells the police officers is that Lorraine is actually an abusive kind of mother towards Laura Lee. And Laura fully supports this. She's just sitting there and she's adding details to the story. And one of the notable details would be that Laura would say that Lorraine, so the adoptive mom, had beaten her with a hairbrush if she gained any weight. Obviously, the police takes this seriously. They have to investigate this because it's child abuse and this child is already sort of with the adoptive family. So Lorraine gets arrested and she is charged with child abuse and neglect. She would later be released on $1,000 bail. We have a couple of wheels being put into motion, right? On one side, we have Ona making those claims and Laura Lee supporting them. And then on the other side, we have the adoptive parents, Otto and Lorraine. However, Ona is going to get another supporter. And that supporter would be Laura Lee's biological mom. She appeared prior to the custody trial. What happened here is, after filing that police report, Ona actually picked up the phone and called Lena. Laura Lee's biological mom. So when Lena reappears, she supports all of these claims and actually says on top of that, the adoption of her biological daughter was fraudulent. One day, her, her drama coach and agent, a woman named Ona Worgan, showed up at their apartment in Hollywood to take her for an interview. Well, rather than taking her to the interview, she took her to the police and alleged that, her, that Laura Lee's adoptive mother, her name was Lorraine Mickle, had beaten her, and Laura Lee echoed that story, telling the police that her adoptive mother beat her with a hairbrush if she gained a pound. She was trying to keep her small for movies. So uh, Lorraine, her, her mother, was arrested on abuse charges, and Laura Lee was put in foster care um, with, with a pastor in Burbank. And that began this, you know, descent into chaos, another trial, uh, her, her coach, uh, called her um, uh, uh, her biological mother in Texas. She got on a, a bus, traveled to Los Angeles, contested the adoption, saying it was done out of fraud, and she wanted the child back. And there began sort of two very salacious trials, a custody hearing and one for abuse um, that her, her, her mother was facing that, you know, garnered headlines not only all over the country, but the world. And in fact, it, it it, it merited, you know, front page placement for months in the LA Times. So let's talk about this, because Otto and Lorraine will face two trials. One of them would be the custody one over Laura Lee, and then the other one would be for the abuse allegations. First comes the custody trial. And from Otto's letters home, we would really find out what the atmosphere was like prior to that trial. Otto would heavily claim that there was a whole conspiracy plot against him and Lorraine, and the head of that conspiracy was Ona, the drama coach. According to him, Ona had brought Laura Lee's mother to LA to just strengthen their case for custody of the girl. Otto and Lorraine believed that the accusations and trials against them were just a guise to gain control of Laura Lee who they thought was viewed as a source of income by everybody involved. And by that, I think he meant like, oh, she's viewed as the source of income for Ona and Lena, like that, kind of like the plaintiffs, right? Whereas, I mean, pretty sure that then you are benefiting as well, because while she was in your custody for years, she's still making a ton of money. But, hey, he's claiming that the other party is at fault here. In his letters, Otto would blame anybody who was supporting Ona's claims, including this reverend that would be prevalent in this story later, Reverend Sundstrom. And he was calling them all rich dukes and part of this larger-than-life plan. He would say, We are up against one of the slickest, slimiest, diabolical frame-ups you could possibly imagine. Ona Worging has been working and waiting for this opportunity for two years. She and her degenerate racketeering husband and the clique have hooked up one of the slickest deals you could possibly imagine. It's colossal. Something that stood out to me there was the mention of two years. Like, if somebody who was hired by them, may I add, the drama coach that was hired by them, is working on this scheme for two years, 
like this was happening right under their noses and none of them noticed like she really hated the two of them that she was trying to make more and more money off of Laura Lee herself like why not mention something earlier if that is really what you have always thought that she was conjuring this up she was conjuring up this whole plan for about two years. The custody hearing would actually be held behind closed doors, but a lot of details of it were reported to the press. So Laura would testify that her adoptive mom beat her with a hairbrush if she gained any weight, and she also said she was so hungry that she had to steal milk and cheese left on the neighbor's doorsteps. She claimed that her adoptive dad, so Otto, took her to the bars and gave her peanuts to eat while he was the one drinking. She told the judge that she did not want to stay with Otto and Lorraine and wished to return to her birth mother and live in a shack. The press here, interestingly, turns on her, because they always do when it comes to these children. How dare they complain when she had such a great career? So now, from the articles about her being the next Shirley Temple, we see her described as a problem child, troubled actress, and poor little rich girl. Lorraine would, during this trial, deny all of the allegations of abuse and claim that Laura Lee's uncontrolling appetite was due to a thyroid condition, but she denied restricting her food intake to keep her small for movie roles. Bear in mind this child is 10 years old at this point, just as we are going through all of that. So plaintiff's version of events, meaning Ona and Laura Lee's birth mother, Lena, the people that are bringing the case against another in the court of law. Well, according to Ona, she was just trying to protect Laura Lee after noticing bruises and suspecting abuse. Lena added to that story, saying she would have never given Laura Lee up for adoption had it not been for her husband threatening her with violence if she didn't. Lena would claim that she didn't know what happened to the girl and didn't have any sort of means, anything at her disposal, to locate her daughter. It was only after she actually saw her in one of the movies, Good Sam, where Laura just appeared and Lena realized the girl had gone to Hollywood. So to Hollywood she must go and this is when she decided, I want my child back. Lena's credibility really would take the hit based off of what the lawyers have found. So they presented the court with the adoption papers that were signed by Lena herself, apparently not under the rest and also a letter that she wrote to the adoptive parents, basically saying, like, thank you for taking care of my daughter and adopting her. But they also presented the Texas Welfare Report, stating that Lena had abandoned Laura Lee, but also the rest of the children, like all five, possibly six of them, in 1945. Now, before the verdict was read, and I find this extremely interesting and so, so bizarre, there is this press report, because all the drama would kind of spill outside of the courtroom. So, on February the 8th, 1950, this is exactly what happened while everybody was waiting for the judge to make a decision. Laura Lee was spotted with her biological mom, Solina, in the hallway. And apparently she ran into her arms and was crying, and then Lorraine rushed towards Laura Lee, and sort of like the two of them started arguing, the biological mom and the adoptive mom. The pictures of the incident would show the ladies in proper hats, dresses, and just handbags going at it. They would call this a battle with fists, and then bailiffs had to separate them. The press would report completely conflicting events of the procedurals of that day, when the verdict was supposed to be announced. So, from this moment that apparently people have witnessed in the hallway, they go into the courtroom. And here is where they would say that Laura Lee was actually crying for her biological mom. However, then upon the verdict, again, once they exited that courtroom, they would say a completely different thing. She was very much attached to Lorraine, her adoptive mom, and calling her my sweet mother, and then calling Otto her wonderful father. And this, even though I think it's very sensationalized reporting by the press, could be true, because Lorraine, the adoptive mother, ended up winning that custody case. So, as a result, Lena, Laura Lee's biological mom, lost a bid to regain the custody of the daughter, she exited the courtroom and was never heard from again. 
According to one of Lena's granddaughters who stayed in contact with her, Lena never mentioned or spoke the name of her daughter again. So she never spoke of Laura Lee after this, which kind of makes you question her actions a little bit, like what was her take, why was she there, was she there, maybe for her own gain. But what I find interesting is that report of the day, as told by the press, because Laura Lee, something that you need to understand, was fed lines, quite literally, to play parts in different movies her whole life. So yes, maybe in the courtroom she believed she's going to return to her biological mother, and she wanted to return to her biological mother. And then upon the decision, she realized, okay, cool, now I need to live with these two individuals. So yes, I do need to pose with the cameras and basically pretend like I belong in this role now. I belong in this part of my life. I belong here. I just think we have to remember that this child at this point was 10 years old and also that for the past couple of years of her life, probably the only ones that actually she could remember, right, like with the early memories and everything, all she had known was to act. All she had known was how to pose in front of the cameras, how to perform, how to create a role, and then develop on it. And maybe, yes, she was doing that inside or outside of the courtroom. However, she's not to blame for any of that. The people that were in that courtroom, the adults, were to blame for everything. The judge here might have actually had the best interest for Laura at heart because he ruled that Laura Lee needed to return to Texas and have a normal childhood, away from Hollywood and away from the show business. The case would actually make an impact on the judge, and he kind of started becoming more and more interesting in protecting child entertainers in the years following the trial. So, during the trial, the judge had expressed doubt about Laura Lee's testimony regarding the abuse, but he also saw a potential in her and wanted her to have the opportunity to grow up and develop as a human being. Now, pause this video and put in the comment section how long do you think that normal life would have lasted, right? Like, the judge prescribed, go back to Texas, fuck Hollywood, and return to normal life. She is in the hands of her adoptive parents. How long did it last? If your answer is anywhere close to three weeks, you're correct. Three weeks later, Laura Lee would make headlines once more. Why? Because she started working on a new movie, the one that was called Between Midnight and Dawn, a criminal noir film involving cops, gangsters, and a love triangle. And on IMDb, that is her last credited role. The family's lawyer would describe this decision as a kind of therapy to eliminate the gruesome details of the custody trial from her mind. I bet, I put in the script, I bet Laura Lee, a 10-year-old, would have told him that. Yeah, she's like, no, this is actually really therapeutic for me, like, going back to this, yeah. She must have, she it must have come right from the source, right from Laura Lee here. Only about a month after that, as Laura Lee is put to bed, her adoptive mom, Lorraine, is just kind of going through the apartment, and then she spots the front door is open. So she obviously goes to the child's room, checks up on her, and realizes Laura Lee is not in her bed. She calls the police to report Laura Lee missing. And what had happened is Laura, yet again a 10-year-old, just left the flat, hailed a cab, and then told the driver the address of that reverend that was supporting Ona and her biological mom in the first trial, and told them the address of their house. So she appears, probably in the middle of the night, I suppose, because she was just being put to bed, at this reverend's house. And even during that ride, she keeps complaining to the cab driver about being hungry, asking the driver to stop at the drive-thru to buy her cheese sandwich, milk, and a pie. Once they actually make it to the pastor's house, Laura Lee tells him that she had lost 10 pounds in the past month and just couldn't take it anymore. So the reverend calls the sheriff's office, and Laura Lee ends up being taken into custody and spending the night in juvenile hall. She again told the authorities she preferred being there because she could play with other children and have all of the extra milk that she wanted. And she didn't want to go back to Otto and Lorraine 
or be in any more movies. So the next day, of course, the press took a hang of the events and Sant'Antonio Express asked what to do with a little girl who would rather eat pie than be in the movies. At this point in my research, my first thoughts were like, this looks really bad for you, Otto and Lorraine, looks really freaking bad for you guys, like the child actually, after being put to sleep, ran away, hailed a cab, like, could have been kidnapped, could have been killed by anybody just to run away from you and like go anywhere and yet again ask for food which is just the bare minimum just give me milk and pie to survive looked pretty bad apparently not apparently not the opinion of a lot of people involved at this point why well Otto, as we know, will claim that this is further conspiracy from Ona, the drama coach, and then the reverend who was involved in the first trial, like supporting the plaintiffs. He believed that Ona was actually visiting Laura Lee while she was in the pastor's house, just like feeding her the information to tell to the police. Judge Scott and the investigator from the DA's juvenile office would meet with Laura Lee the next morning and they were just there to get to the bottom of this whole situation. But they actually found that Laura Lee had gained four pounds. She didn't lose ten, as she had claimed, and the judge was really doubting the story of the abuse, saying that the bruises looked more like she had run into a rose bush, which to me, first of all, they're weighing the child, because how else do they know? that she had apparently gained for instead of lost 10 pounds, but also she had bruises. Full stop. This is yet again a judge. I know that she had, you know, that he had had her best interest at heart in the first trial and he advised for them to move out of Hollywood and all of that. That clearly didn't happen, eh? So, like, see the full picture. But also, you're not a medical professional. She had had the bruises. How do you know what they were from? It's so very much 1950s, where nobody actually, like, followed through, saw her being examined and then made conclusions. No, none of that happens. During the meeting, they also observed that Laura was pouting and acting like she was in front of the camera, and the judge would tell her he wanted the truth and not to put on any airs. According to the judge here, Laura retracted the story of being beaten or starved. Nobody here stopped for a second to think that maybe this girl just wanted to get the hell out of that house. And, and the prescribed not acting, well, she said multiple times she didn't want to continue acting. Yet, the adults got her to act again. Like, if he just checked that, which probably they did, because this will go into the second trial, as we know, yet again, you prescribed not acting, she had been pushed into acting again. Because this is very much he said, she said, we have to think about who was lying here, who would have benefited by spreading conspiracy rumors and keeping Laura Lee in their care. The journalist researching this story said that Otto wasn't super enthusiastic at the beginning of all of this, but then they moved to Hollywood, there was excitement about that, but more importantly, the financial gain hit them once Laura Lee came into their life. It was reported that Laura Lee's films and earned her $14,000. This is the equivalent of $156,000 in today's money. So they were definitely $156,000 richer after adopting Laura Lee. The abuse trial would start on March the 21st in Beverly Hills Municipal Court, and the jury would consist of eight women and four men. The child's weight, as expected, was the centerpiece of this trial. Laura Lee would take the stand on the first day. She was crying, saying how her adoptive mother would whip her with a hairbrush after she would buy candy when she was supposed to be in Sunday school, and how Lorraine would tell her she couldn't eat any candy because the movies didn't like actors to be fat. She testified she was constantly hungry. She would see sometimes delivery men leaving the milk in front of front doors, and she would go and drink and steal milk from the neighbors. This was all reported in the newspaper articles that I found from this era. During the cross-examination, Laura Lee changed her story and said that her adoptive mother had put her to bed, not whipped her, after she stole candy. She also claimed that her acting coach 
on a wording, had instructed her on what to say, and had directed her to take milk and cottage cheese without asking questions. There will be quite a few witnesses on Lorraine's side. Lorraine herself would actually take the stand, describing that she was anxious in December after Laura Lee didn't come home from school. She said that she ended up finding Laura Lee wandering near Sunset Boulevard. And when she asked her where she got the money from Candy, Laura Lee would just kind of hesitantly say that she had taken it from the teacher. Lorraine admitted to spanking her with her bare hand. She didn't admit to anything else, like no specking or beating her with a hairbrush and definitely no further repercussions. Then Ona would take the stand, she denied coaching Laura Lee or instructing her to steal from her neighbors, but testified to seeing marks on her arms and buttocks that were black and blue. Ona would claim that Lorraine admitted to whipping Laura Lee, leaving marks on her, and that Lorraine would even instruct Laura Lee to cover up with enough clothes in order for it not to show when she would have, like, the modeling shoots. After the jury took seven hours to deliberate, they would acquit Lorraine. One of the jurors would end up telling the media that they had largely agreed that there wasn't much evidence to support the beating charge, but they took a long time deciding on the issue of Laura Lee's diet. Only in the 50s. Also, yet again, did anybody examine that child? I have not found any records of that to support the beating charge. So, like, did they really work that hard to support it? Otto would end up telling the reporters that he had trusted in God and now knew that God was on their side. Lorraine would consider taking a family trip to Europe and described a recent visit with Laura Lee in which her daughter asked when she could go back to the movies. But Lorraine said they would never put her back in pictures. In the summer of 1950, it seemed like the adoptive parents might actually be following through on that promise of a normal life. They returned to Schulenburg in July, and the judge actually kept tabs on them, rather sort of spoke to the taxes authorities for them to have jurisdiction over the child. And then Laura Lee joined them in August. And her return was, of course, documented by the press at the local airport. And this is where, briefly, she would be reunited with her sister, Barbara. Barbara would remember this event. She would remember them taking a picture together. Barbara was seven at this point, And Laura Lee was nine or like, going on ten. She remembered the homecoming, saying that Laura Lee was very loving and sang songs to her from the movies. That initial excitement of Laura Lee's return would fade away, but the press was still very much reporting on everything that she was doing in the first couple of years that she had returned to Texas. She was sent to live in a convent and also attended public school. We knew that her activities would involve playing with classmates, going to the movies, and also joining the Girl Scouts. I put in the script, I don't know, did press ban exist then? Because this should have been the first thing that the judge was to have done. The San Antonio Express would also report that Laura Lee appeared chubby and in perfect health during her visit to the city. And despite the promises to the judge, it was also found out that the adoptive parents were tempted by the offers from the movies, radio, and TV that were coming in. This was according to the letter that they would write to the agents in New York. We know, however, from the IMDb page and also from not seeing Laura Lee's face in any further movies that she isn't credited for any other ones. But between 1950, so her return to Schulenburg, and 1953, we lose her trail a bit. And by 1953, the situation had changed drastically. Otto ended up dying of pancreatic cancer at age 65, and Lorraine lived for other two years before she died herself from lung cancer. Laura Lee was said not to have attended any of their funerals. And when they passed away, Laura Lee, now a teenager, lived a more sheltered life. And the details of her later years are really not well documented. 
This is why we need another character to this story, and that is the journalist, Stacey Perman, that wrote for LA Times. I mean, she writes for the LA Times. She just wrote the most detailed story on this case, and then had given a, quite a few interviews for, I think it is also the Times podcast, and I have seen some videos on YouTube as well. So, Stacy started receiving long buried records held in Federal Records Center in Fort Worth. They contained the summaries of Laura Lee's psychological evaluations, her school reports, criminal dockets, court, and other filings. And she, upon receiving all of that, did a deep dive, contacted Barbara, contacted her family, and just tried to find where Laura Lee went from there. So she loops us in on where the story goes from this point on. What the family had thought, so her sister Barbara and the biological family, was that Laura Lee was taken to New York once Otto died, and that she was taken there to audition for a play and then ended up being arrested and sent to reform school. And this is what they fought for decades, up until, actually, the journalists took all of the records, put them into a timeline, and told them that this is not what happened. That instead of New York, Laura Lee went to Houston. There, she would be placed in different Catholic charities, and from there, she would cycle through a bunch of foster homes and would drop out of school after the 11th grade when she was 17 years old, because she ended up being pregnant by her first husband. Before I introduce the husbands to you in a very Evelyn Hugo style, let's talk about the psychological reports and claims that the journalist Stacey Berman managed to find on Laura Lee. So, we know that between 53 and 57, she ended up cycling between different foster homes. And this is when she would be described as emotionally unstable, insecure, and without a father figure in her early years. The report here mentioned that Laura Lee had a very abusive childhood and never had a consistent home environment. The records from her private school that she attended in Houston showed that she was a poor student and also would skip classes a lot. The principal of the school would say that he doubted Laura Lee had ever been in films, stating that she was mentally incapable, but he noted that she always tried to act. Back to our timeline, the year is 1957, Laura Lee just dropped out from 11th grade, and she ended up being pregnant, so she decides to marry her husband number one. Husband number one's name is Donald. Well, Donald Mayo Ford. One word description of this man that I put into the script is meh. We don't have enough details for me to make a conclusion on this guy, okay? Cool. She meets Donald, and from most accounts, it is because she ended up being pregnant with his child. So she gives birth to a girl who she named Donna Ann. And Donna Ann, so her daughter, was put up for adoption with a family in Houston. According to the court documents that the journalist found, Donald claimed to have divorced Laura Lee around November or December of 1958, so just about a year into their marriage, but there was no record of this, just like the claims that they were actually divorced. And, in fact, in February of 1959, they ended up welcoming another child, called William Henry who was born with a lung condition, so the boy died only three hours after being born. Seven months later, Laura Lee ended up checking herself into Austin State Hospital. This would be the psychiatric facility, and this was because of a nervous breakdown. Because this is 1957, according to the reports by the journalist, the reason for her breakdown and hospitalization was claimed not to be known. I put, like, were we okay in the 1950s? She just had a stillbirth. Like, of course, she's traumatized. Like, even before all of the other trauma, there is a major reason why somebody would maybe want to be hospitalized themselves in this condition. Here, she would tell the psychiatrist that she was raised by foster parents who were killed in a car accident. Her biological parents, she said, had also died in a car crash. 
This, as we know, was not true, but the tale, a lot of people were saying, reminded them of the movie The Snake Pit that she was actually in. She was discharged from this hospital after nine days. And Barbara would say about this period in time, nobody told her about it. Possibly because the family where she was adopted into, so Otto's brother's family, was quite strict. But also possibly because they didn't really want her to have anything to do with Michelle's, with Otto and Lorraine, and also with Laura Lee. They wanted them to live completely separate lives, which is so bizarre, because Otto at this point is dead. Like, the least that family can do is welcome these two biological sisters and let them catch up and just play, do childhood things. But that's not what happens. After her discharge from the hospital, Laura Lee returns to Houston and starts working different office jobs. She would sell magazines for a publishing company and also worked as a typist with the Houston Transit Co., earning about $200 a month. So quite a difference from $100 a day to just having a regular salary at the time. This is when she would meet husband number two, called Joe, <laughs> that I described in three words this time, the older guy. Joe Wendell Owen was a handsome former Marine, nine years her senior. They ended up getting married on March the 5th, 1960, according to the marriage certificate that the journalists managed to find. This is still happening in Texas. Days after her marriage, Laura Lee would write to her aunt and uncle, saying that she planned the honeymoon to San Antonio for the weekend. She would say, Joy would like very much to meet you, since you are the only family that I have got. It's been a long time since I have seen you, and I'm sure I'm anxious to see you all. By all accounts, this letter would be Laura Lee's last attempt to contact her family. According to Barbara's children, the uncle and aunt that Laura just ended up writing this letter to never actually responded. So, of course, if you're Laura Lee in this situation, you have just reached out to your family and never heard back. So, of course, you think, like, I have to struggle myself. I have to hustle, rely on myself in order to move on with my life, because my family doesn't really want anything to do with me. Two adoptive parents are now dead, and the only family that she has is biological one, and they don't want anything to do with her. Moving on, more on Joey, husband number two. I put this in my script. <laughs> you have to hear it, because I wrote it, apparently. The thing with older men, dot, 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 they swindle you. And Laura Lee, just like her mom, always looked to run. Okay, let's, let's hear more on that. Why do they swindle you, Maya, you may wonder. Well, the two of them got married after knowing each other for only a few weeks. But then, within two weeks of their marriage, Laura Lee ends up leaving him without any explanation. Joey was apparently quite taken with her. The story also mentions that a few months after he married Laura Lee, he married another woman. Oh, is that why? Is that why? Is that why he's a swindler? Let's find out. This is when it gets interesting, forward slash complicated. So, how do we know this information? Joey ended up having a daughter. Now, this daughter, if you're following, didn't come from that very, very short marriage with Laura Lee. Laura Lee managed to skedaddle out of there. So, this daughter came from what I understood was never really a legal marriage, and that is to the other woman. Now, why that was never a legal marriage is because Laura Lee was never found from this point on, or rather, Joey couldn't find her. So, from his daughter, we find out he wanted to put an ad in the newspapers, kind of like, hey, missing person, lost and found, my wife, you get a type of the ad that he wanted to put in the papers, but the new to-be wife discouraged him from doing this, because she didn't want the world to know that she is dating a married man. Going back to my line here, where is the infamous line? The thing with older men, they swindle you. I think this might have been just my bias towards older men. Um, writing under the influence, because he didn't swindle anybody, did he? 
In fact, if anybody swindled anybody, it's Laura Lee by disappearing at this point and not letting this man marry anybody else. Because you would think that this is the point that she vanishes, because this saga never has its ending, but we still have to go through two husbands. Two husbands. And Stacy here is a woman after my own research heart, okay? Because she went through newspapers.com, went through all of the old newspapers, and she happened upon a line announcing the marriage between Miss Laura Lee Michelle and Mr. Cary Hand Gray. The article dated September 6, 1960. The couple married a week earlier, and this would be six months after Laura Lee's marriage to Joey. So, husband number three, Carrie, three word description, the gullible one. And this might be the most accurate description that I have written in this whole saga. Because in 1962, so two years after their marriage, there was a car theft reported in the papers where a woman was accused of stealing her ex-husband's car. Later, when the journalist was investigating the case, it was revealed that the ex-husband was Carrie, the gullible one, who was also a pharmacist in Houston. They called this man a druggist. And literally, I, I'm glad I googled this. I don't know what crossed my mind to actually google this, because I thought that meant a drug dealer. So, hey. You can always congratulate yourself for being smarter than me today. The journalist here attempted to contact Carrie's family and discovered that he had eight children and a wife. From one of those children, we find out how Carrie and Laura Lee had actually met. So, they ended up meeting after Carrie's wife passed away and he was lonely. They met at a bar, they started chatting. However, the family immediately expressed their dislike towards the new person in their father's life. They thought that Laura Lee was a con artist who ended up stealing things from the family. From what I read, mostly China, like the family China. Eventually, Carrie's credit was ruined and he ended up losing his car and his house. And his kids would always say that this was the fault of Laura Lee. Carrie's kids would say that Laura Lee left multiple times. And the first time that she left, she just took a bunch of stuff with her. And they thought she would just stay gone because she stole stuff. So they thought, okay, she doesn't want to return because then maybe we report it to the police. She doesn't stay gone, however. She returns and her husband, Carrie, buys her a new house. He buys her even a new convertible car and then they're sported around driving that vehicle. She stays for a while and then she leaves again. After she left this time, Laura Lee took that brand new car with her. She had driven in it. And the daughter here knew, she just knew, she is going to return to steal more from the family, as if, like, stealing the car wasn't enough. Because now Carrie had to actually go to work by bus. He had to actually just go move into a rental house, move with all of those kids, just to pay off of the debt and pay off, like, for all of the items that Laura Lee was stealing. So, she does exactly that. And here, the daughter of Carrie's actually remembers this anecdote where she saw Laura Lee for the last time. So, it happens that Laura Lee actually did come back, apparently, to this rental house where they were living to steal more stuff. And this is when a scuffle ensued, the daughter screamed for Carrie to come out and to deal with the situation. And it was said that Carrie, even here, like, sort of to separate the daughter and his wife, punched Laura Lee. After that, Penny never saw or heard from her, well, stepmother here. Is it a stepmother? Yeah, because it Laura Lee wasn't her mother, but was married to her dad. She never heard from her again and has no idea what happened to her. Carrie would tell the investigators that the two of them were only married for about three or four months. He said they divorced in November 1961 on the grounds of incompatibility. But Stacy, the journalist, wasn't able to find the divorce record. According to Stacy, Laura Lee had moved on from Carrie and ended up marrying husband number four, Frank O'Neill Scott a man who was already married with children, he had a history of heavy drinking, and also had a history of writing bad checks. So, we go to husband number four, the last husband of the day. The description here, two-word description, the messy. Not like the messy one, just 
everything. The general vibe of this marriage was messy, was messy. Let me elaborate. The first reason why it was messy, both of them were married to other people, legally married, when somehow they did get married because they were the marriage records of this on July 22nd, 1961. The court filings called it a bigamous marriage, and after they were married, Frank took Laura Lee to his hometown in Iowa. This is where, from all of the accounts, he would turn her into a sex worker. He would be pimping Laura Lee out. They ended up even being arrested for a week, and they were just constantly, constantly scheming. They only spent a week in jail because the reason why they were sentenced was for stealing a marked $20 bill. It ended up being found rather hidden in Frank's shoe. And the only anecdote, not really an anecdote, just a one-liner that people have, the press had, from this jail stunt was that Laura Lee was said to be tap dancing while behind bars. So after a week in jail, the two of them are released, and this is when they start moving from state to state and just scheming and writing bad checks. However, their downfall came with the visit to this car dealership. So they said, like, yeah, we're definitely going to buy this car. We just want to take it for a test drive. That test drive leads them all the way to Houston. And this is where Laura Lee's husband number three lived. So we have Carrie, husband number three, the gullible one. We have Frank, the messy. Cool? So, I suppose, again, nobody really clarifies this in this record, but I suppose Laura Lee did this on her own accord. She goes back to Carrie, to her third husband, asking him to lend her his car. Now, this is like the brand new car that he had bought for her. If you remember, she had gone to steal one last time from the family, had a whole scuffle with the daughter. What I didn't tell you was that the daughter basically put a knife through the tires, right? So that she can't actually take the car away from the family. They exchanged those tires, but the car now was luckily with husband number three for him to do whatever that he wants because it's his own car. Carrie, because probably he was still smitten by his wife that he never legally divorced from what we know, actually allows her to take this car. And now she is spending time and doing fuck knows what with husband number four, with Frank, in husband number three's car. I know that this is insane. And it gets even more insane because in the glove compartment of that car, there were still some cards that Carrie just never took out. So for six months, they live in this car, they went all the way to Missouri, and they're living off of the credit cards that were in the glove compartment. Because you couldn't just report fraud online in those days, they actually ran up about 3,700 in bills on those free credit cards that they could find, and they got away with this for quite some time. Laura Lee even answered an ad for a governess that was put up by a self-employed contractor called Leonard Voiles. So she actually started working for this guy, and he paid her $40 a week, and she had room and board in this place. The end of the road for the two of them came at a highway near El Paso in 1963, when the patrolman picked both of them up. They ended up facing five years in prison and $5,000 fine. So they pled guilty to one count of stealing a car and crossing state lines. Laura Lee would end up being sentenced to 13 months in federal prison in West Virginia. And her husband, well, husband number four here, uh, was sentenced to 27 months in prison in Texas. After about two months in jail, Laura Lee was released on bail. She ended up returning to live with her employer, because this is where she had room and board. And the records from prison were not available, so we don't know why she only served two months, because she was supposed to be released in April of 1964. The official trail of information on Laura Lee ends here. She was delivered on March the 9th, 1963, to the Federal Reformatory for Women in Elderson. And this would be the administrative end of her life, right? Like, 
anything that Stacey Perman could find on her that was actually recorded, that was on the books, that was within court documents in this instance. The very last comment that we have on Laura Lee's, that's on the official record, comes from her probation officer, who described her as somebody very impulsive, and from every indication, she must have had a most unfortunate background. There was no further record of her. There was no social security records, no prison records. From what Stacy could find, she stayed with the fourth husband, Frank, for some time, but eventually the two of them split up as well, and his kids also just have, like, vague memories of the events surrounding this. So, where the story goes from now is Barbara and her family really searching for Laura Lee. They had some memorabilia that was related to her that was just passed down through the family for generations. So, in an effort to learn more about her, Barbara's daughters and the rest of the family started searching for information on her, using letters, new technology like digital databases and social media. In 2010, they even went on IMDb and posted there, asking if anybody has any clues towards Laura Lee, but they only got one response, and this was from somebody that knew Laura Lee in her childhood, so nobody that really could provide them with any information from 1963, 1963 onwards. And it was said that Laura Lee's second husband, Joey, was also trying to find her, and this is most probably in order to finalize that divorce and marry the other woman that he was dating at the time. Now, from Joey's daughter, we actually find out the last piece of information that provided Barbara and the family with some closure. He had kept a huge record of notes during his search for his wife, and it was said that in those notes, he wrote, I found a mutual friend, Herb Fisher, and found out Laura Lee had died sometime in 1979 from cancer. We don't know any information on Herb Fisher. I tried looking for something that connects Herb Fisher and Laura Lee. We don't know what his qualifications were, how he obtained this information. We haven't seen a single document of any hospital records of any cancer diagnosis here. There's no death certificate, and there's also no gravesite. Nothing to confirm this. However, the family does believe that Laura Lee is dead. Barbara did say when she heard this information, it was closure to her, and it just made sense because there's just no further records of Laura Lee. They supposed that she wouldn't be alive now, just based off of when she was born, and they just accepted it as closure. She would say she knew in her heart her sister was not alive. She would have reached out, and she tried so hard to find her when young. And it turned out that in 1985, a friend of his had helped him look for her, and he was able to tell him that Laura Lee had died in 1979, six years earlier, of cancer. Did your reporting give the family of Laura Lee any closure? It did. You know, as her sister Barbara, who had been looking for her for decades, told me when I laid out everything for them, she said, I've got closure, but it's heartbreaking. That is where the story ends, with Stacy sitting down the whole family, Barbara's side of the family that was looking for Laura Lee, telling them what she had found out based off of her research, and also that one last piece of information based off of her speaking with the daughter of the second husband, and what she had read in the notes about cancer diagnosis and Laura Lee dying in 1979. This However, even though it is closure for the family, if true, and it has not been confirmed true by any official record, leaves a gap between 1963 and 1979. We have almost month-on-month -month information before that, and then nothing. No reach out to the family, to the third husband at least, who she stole from multiple times, no new marriages, no fleeing. So, what do you think happened to Laura Lee? And do you think it happened before 1979? Or do you, like the family, accept the version that provides you with closure? 
Upon her arrest in 1963, Laura Lee was asked what happened to the career that seemed so promising. Her answer was that she grew up. After enduring two trials, she was finally free from everyone that made decisions on her behalf. She did everything in her power to flee, from the authorities and from her past. The mystery of her disappearance might have been her last attempt to move on and play a part in one thing she never had control of, her own life. And that is the story of Laura Lee Michelle. Quite a different one this week. There is a website online, there's a Facebook page, I think there's even a Twitter page, where you can contact the family, obviously, only if you have legitimate information. If Stacy couldn't find anything officially, and I don't know, you can, or you have known Laura Lee from 1963 onwards, whichever circumstance that was, like probably if you have any proof, any legitimacy to your account of events, you can contact the family and provide them with further answers. Personally, I think, what's 1963, 16 years? Math, quick math, it's very simple math, I should not be proud of that. 16 years. If she had actually died in 69, would have given 16 years just on the run. Doing God knows what, not following the same pattern that she was. Not legally marrying people in different states, not scheming, not stealing, not being imprisoned every now and then. I don't know. I don't know if I fully buy into that. I don't know, because obviously even the 1969 account of events doesn't really provide us with any official information. It's not by somebody official, it's just notes written in someone's diary from the sounds of it. Now, I understand how it can provide closure to the family, and I don't blame anybody for accepting this story. Probably Laura Lee is not among us today, probably she's not alive, based on her being born in 1940s. There's no body, there's no gravesite, there's no death certificate. You have to ponder, like, what had actually happened to this woman? What kind of fate did she meet and when? You let me know your theories in the comments, as always, and I should be reading the book that is on top of, I think, other books, like Evelyn Hugo and uh, Marilyn there in the background, and then possibly telling you about that book, because that's how it works, right? <laughs> Read a book, and then I sit in front of a camera. You get it, you get it. If you like the deep dives that I do on here, or have topic suggestions, yeah, leave the comments, like and subscribe. I, I suck at YouTube, I never say these things, and you apparently should, because it gets people to do what you say. So do that, and leave me comments for any other mysteries, any other suggestions or the cases that I might uh, cover. Yes, I asked this on Twitter, but people on Twitter ignore my ass. True crime book recommendations. I need some really good ones this year, so if you have those, also leave them in the comments, because then I'm gonna mm, put my claws into like actual true crime books, read them for you, and then tell you a story. Multi-parters, let's go. Make them chunky, okay? Make them like Marilyn, like 700 plus pages. <laughs> Because that was, that was, that was my Bible, okay? That was my Bible, and I love that book, but 700-something pages, god damn it. Cool, anyways, yeah, you have the whole case of Marilyn Monroe, you know, on this channel, if you want to watch it, it's like eight hours away, so... <laughs> of course there is. So, um, I shall be seeing you guys after I research your next case, and you let me know the theories on this one. Bye! Bye! Bye out! Ooh, this would be like a good transition. You know how on TikTok they do transitions? Mm -hmm. What are you going to transition into? Your PJs. Let's do that. Okay, so, like, you do it like this. Oh, God, this is going to be the worst editing ever. Okay, do it, do it. Okay, and now you're going to see me in my PJs. <laughs> That's not how this happens. Okay, okay. You do it. Play some cool music on in the background. Oh, my God. The stress this is giving me. Okay, and now PJs. Woo! Absolutely cannot wait to see how bad this turned out. <laughs> Never a TikToker out to me, okay? They're all young and they know exactly what they're doing because what you're supposed to be doing, right? Is going from like a basic ass look into a glam look, like full makeup, party outfit and stuff. And 
I have just changed from uh, recording look into the editing, which is back into my PJs. That is the type of content you can truly expect here. And now I will spare you a couple more minutes of your life that you might have wasted on this outro. And see you next time. I'll see you when I see you. I can't believe you did this. I actually can't believe you gonna change from the yellow fucking thing into your PJs to do what? To do what? This is how. They're pointless. They're pointless. If you really are on TikTok, they're pointless, okay? But you still stick around because you're not better than me. And we are all not better than any man out there. We see boobies, we stay for boobies. <laughs> Just my out. You don't stay for men doing first traps, do you? Do you? Do you? Identity crisis? I will see you guys next week or in about 10 to 15 days. Cool. You are better than me. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. And I am respecting the art of sticking around for the first traps on TikTok. Okay, cool. My out now. My exit is short. Good.